Hi, Laura, how are you? I'm good. I think I'm slightly terrified because I can see there's a few people in there who know an awful lot more about PR than I do. So, <laughs> That's um... okay. This isn't an interview. <laughs> I have not checked out with Andrew Neil uh, how to, to be tough, all this kind of stuff. It's Are we allowed to willing... do phone a friend? So if I don't know the answer, I can... <laughs> That's right, phone a friend, right. Excellent. Phone Jeremy Corbyn, right, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> on which basis, if Samuel Kind would like to turn his WhatsApp function on, I'd be very grateful because then he can correct my statistical errors. <laughs> right, right. Um, so, yeah, this is uh, not a grilling. This is a try what my job is to sort of try to bring out what I consider some of the more important issues in relating to this question. Um, um, and to be clear, <laughs> You know, there's all these other questions, asked, not when, but after we convince the Labour Party to support PR, there's a whole bunch of other questions down the road, progressive alliance, this, that. We're not going to, I mean, if you want to ask them, but we're not going to get too much into that. I, I really like kind of step-by-step -step organizing. We first of all win Labour over, then we decide what comes next. Uh, okay, so let me start with two introductory questions, Laura. Uh, those being, so a lot of people here don't know who you are, um, and your parents do, but um, lots of people, and, and your values. So let me ask you first off, why did you decide to join the Labour Party? Um, well, I joined twice, actually. I joined once very, I lived abroad for many, many years, and uh, during that time I, I wasn't a Labour Party member. And then I briefly um, came back to the UK just around the time that Ed Miliband got elected as Labour leader. And I thought he seemed like quite a nice, sincere bloke. And um, so, um, so I joined the Labour Party, I guess, because I decided it, it, was the, it was the best opportunity for changing the government, really. And it was a stultifyingly dull and un uninspiring experience. I think he was a very nice leader, but as a Labour Party member in cities in Westminster, where there was obviously a Tory MP, it wasn't very exciting. So I, and then I went abroad again and sort of kind of forgot about it. And then I came back to the UK just around the time that Labour lost the election in 2015. I didn't vote for the Labour Party in that election. I was in a very, very safe Labour seat in South London with a, with a so-called Labour MP who I couldn't abide, Kate Hoey. So I didn't vote for Kate Hoey. I voted for a small left group, actually, um, as I wanted to signal my support for sort of radical politics. And then, you know, Labour didn't win the election. Jeremy Corbyn stood to be the leader. And I was really inspired by that. I'd been a lifelong member of the campaign for nuclear disarmament. Um, my mum, who is sitting out there in Cone Valley, um, used to run the local peace group. Um, my dad had been very involved in uh, struggles in particular around education and universities. So I guess I came from a very political family and Corbyn just spoke to a lot of what I thought was most important about what we needed to do in the country, obviously anti-austerity, he wants to invest in public services and um, you know he was never going to take us to an illegal war, he's a committed environment campaign and understood I think issues around climate change long before many other mainstream politicians did. And so I joined, I joined the party that he was leading and the party with that political program, and it happened to be the Labour Party. Um, it, could, it could have been the Tiddlywinks party, to be honest. I was drawn by the politics and I'm not really a, a sort of dyed in the wool Labour person in many ways, but yeah, I was very, very inspired by Corbyn. And I was also working at the time for an NGO um, with local authorities working with children in care. And you could just see that local social services were on their knees. And I think it was very obvious that to me, as to millions of us, that something needed to radically change. So yeah, I joined the Labour Party and there's not been a dull moment since. That's right, <laughs> okay. Now the other question I'd like to ask you right at the beginning, just so we get this out of the way, not out of the way, but just so we make sure we cover this. Um, you also now work for Labour for a New Democracy, the 11 party alliance, which Get PR Done is a member. Could you, you know, in two or three minutes, tell us 
So what is the basic project of labor for a new democracy? What are you trying to do? Uh, what, what's the game plan, how you work? So as you say, this is a coalition of 11 organizations of which uh, Get PR Done is one. Um, labor Campaign for Electoral Reform, which is a long-standing organization that's been working to get the Labour Party to change its policy on this. Uh, Make Votes Matter, which is a cross-party campaign, Compass, and, and many others. Um, and the, the singular and very focused goal for the moment is to change Labour Party policy. The first step towards that is to get a motion passed at party conference, hopefully this September, committing the Labour Party to PR. It's not trying to commit the Labour Party to any particular form of PR, partly because we probably wouldn't agree as a coalition necessarily on what that should be, but, but also because we want the Labour Party to make an infirm in principle commitment, which the whole of the Labour Party can, can get behind. Um, and so our goal at the moment is to get motions passed by constituency Labour Parties saying that they want the Labour Party to commit to PR. Um, at some point in probably May, May, June, just after the elections, possibly a little bit before in some constituencies, we'll be asking people to pass conference motions. If you're not a Labour Party member, you might not know that you have two sorts of policy motions. You have a sort of standard one, and then you have the very specific one that you that you have to write, which has a certain word limit and a certain sort of layout to take to party conference. So we need to get as many motions passed by constituency Labour parties as possible, and as many conference motions. And in parallel, we need to try to win over as much support as we can from the trade union movement, uh, because the way that Labour Party conference works, effectively votes are taken um, between party, ordinary party members and affiliates. And in the end, each will count for 50%. So uh, we're, we're working, talking to trade union uh, members across the, primarily across the 11 affiliated trade unions, which are part of the, of the Labour Party. And then of course, we're also talking to members of the Parliamentary Labour Party and to other activists who are, who are kind of really engaged Labour Party members whose first priority might not be PR, but they may be engaged in, I don't know, um, campaigning against homelessness or for human rights, um, campaigning for a Green New Deal. We're trying to talk to as many party activists as we can because they're the kind of people that are going to go to party conference. Um, and obviously we'll also be talking to the party leadership and people on the National Executive Committee, which is the elected governing body of the party. And that basically is the aim between now and September. Okay. Now, the, the slightly tougher questions begin, Laura. <laughs> That's so, it was going so well. <laughs> <laughs> um, last week, um, we in Get PR Done put out a meme that's really been seen, it's one of our most popular memes, tens of thousands of people. And it said, why is the labor, I sent you one, I know, why is the labor party the, ocean, the only social democratic party in the developed world that still supports, um, oh, there it is, there we go. Here's, here's, here's the, exactly the, the meme. Uh, why is it the, that still supports the first past the post voting system? So the question is, why don't you ask the question? Why is that? Why is the Labour Party you know, in Germany, I'm just, I'm New Zealand, we can go on on, why is it you know, sort of really out of step with yeah. why? Why? Okay. Um, others of you in the Labour Party supplement this afterwards because you might all have your own interpretations. Part of this is a very simple thing, which is not really so much about politics as human beings. I mean, change is scary. There's just something rather simple about sticking with what you know. I think... Um, some Labour Party members of Parliament in particular have got little incentive to change their mind. It's a system that's getting them elected, some of them with enormous majorities. Um, so whether it's self-interest or simply not thinking about it, there are parts of the Parliamentary Labour Party for whom this just isn't a priority. 
For others, I perhaps a more positive interpretation is, you know, it's the hope that kills you. And um, people are hoping, hoping that Labour can still win with the current system. Uh, I think, uh, you know, some people believe that we came very, very close in 2017 and notwithstanding the obviously disastrous results of 2019, hanging on to the hope that maybe it's possible for Labour to win under the current system. And when we can talk a bit, a bit more about that, I... I'm, I, I'm not sure it is. Um, others have genuine questions. They're uncertain about what a new system would be like. So they may not be that convinced by first past the post, but they've got genuine concerns about something new. The biggest one that you hear from kind of active Labour Party members is probably about keeping the constituency link. So without going into the discussion that we don't really want to have about, you know, the minutiae of systems, you know, some people need persuading that they can have a system in which you still know who your MP is. And, you know, and I understand that I live at the moment in Italy and you've got no idea who your MP is here. Now, there's all sorts of things wrong with the way that Italians run their system, but that's definitely part of it for some people. I think another part of it, and you had Jeremy Gilbert talking, I know, a few weeks ago, I thought he was really brilliant, but I think Labour's forgotten some of its own history. So it's forgotten for a start that the first Labour MPs were elected in a pact <laughs> with the Liberals. It's forgotten that Keir Hardy actually supported proportional representation. Um, Jeremy spoke, I thought, very compellingly about the fact that it's forgotten or is just shutting its eyes to the fact that no Labour Party has gone from opposition to then have a really radical government and, and the two points that he made was on the one hand, you know, he didn't classify, I, I probably would agree, the Blair government has been particularly radical. And on the other hand, the Attlee one, which was, hadn't really come from opposition. It had, you know, it had been part of that wartime coalition. Um, so I think part of the reason why the Labour Party is, is hanging on to this is because it's just forgotten some of its own, some of its own history. And then there are, of course, the antagonisms between the parties, which, which are a feature of first past the post and are very hard for people to let, to let go of. Because clearly in, in a proportional system, we would be more likely to be having coalition governments. And um, whilst I think under the leadership of Jeremy Corbyn, the relationship between many Green Party members and the Labour Party was a very warm one. And in fact, many people joined the Labour Party from the Green Party. Um, and some may have gone back since. You know, the relationship with the Liberal Democrats is not quite so positive. People may have forgotten their ancient Labour history, but they're remembering the very recent history of tuition fees. Um, they're forgetting what I think, you know, those of us over sort of 40 will remember, which is that at various points in its relatively recent history, actually the Liberal Democrats have had what some of us would describe as a more progressive position on some political issues, um, like Europe, for example, uh, the penny on the pound for education. They were talking about tax increases when the Labour Party was refusing to do so. But somehow in, in the most recent history, the Liberal Democrats have become the really, really bad guys. PR means coalition, coalition means Lib Liberal Democrats. So I think it's a whole, it, it, it's a mixture. And, and, and and somewhere in there also just something about the party culture. This is a big, big beast of an organization. You know, it's the largest party of its kind in Western Europe with, you know, half a million members. And, uh, you know, it takes time to turn around a steam tanker. Is there, within that, I mean, you know, you mentioned Keir Hardy. It was my ne very next question, actually, uh, unlike another Keir. Um, and, you know, um, you know, historically, socialists have supported PR, like in Germany, Karl Liebknecht. You know, this has been sort of a, a one of the rallying calls of, of socialists, like the, the, the old voting system just kept in place. So can you kind of take us inside the head of someone like Richard Bergen? Or, or the person you used to work for, Jeremy Corbyn. I mean, I remember handing out, trying to hand out a leaflet to Bergen in February in Nottingham. And the leaflets went out very well, get PR done leaflet. He wouldn't even take one. He just almost sort of took my head off for even thinking that 
the, you know, PR. And, like, what is it about this particular brand of, you know, the socialist campaign group, which does include some people who do support PR, to be clear, what is it about them that just sort of think, it, what, what makes them tick to think that we don't need this? I can just see. It's fear of having to compromise too much on a radical political agenda. And that fear makes a lot of sense if you think about the recent history of the Labour Party. I mean, I don't really want to sort of discuss individual MPs, but Richard, no, no. Blair, for example, has got an absolutely excellent record on many of the really big issues. Like Richard Bergen would not have bombed Iraq. <laughs> you know, Richard right. Bergen didn't wouldn't have voted for the welfare bill. Right. Richard Bergen would never have said he was, you know, enormously relaxed about the filthy rich or whatever it was. Some of the new Labour leadership said, and you know, that has engendered a, a genuine concern within the party. You know, it's had to compromise so much within its own party at times that it doesn't want to compromise further with what it sees as its core politics. Now, I actually think the real question is, why don't more people in the Labour Party across the party, left, right and middle, understand that part of the core politics is the very democratic system or is the democratic system itself? That for me is, is really the question. And somewhere along the line, we have lost our way because you cannot divorce the system that we use to elect people from the politics that you then end up getting. Mm -hmm. But you also shouldn't, as a Labour Party member, be relaxed about a system which basically isn't fair. Right. No. And that's not, you know, when you look at clause four, which is the little, I mean, obviously, famously it was amended, but it is, it does still talk about uh, a just society. And it, I think the words are open democracy, it should be fundamental to the values of Labour Party people, just as um, supporting disabled people or ensuring there's adequate provision for uh, education services. I mean, it should be a core part of Labour's being democracy itself. Right. And somewhere along the line, uh, for, for too many, that, that's become a second order question. It's become about the systems and it's become about winning elections right. rather right. than an absolute core part of of who we of who we are um I, I don't know at what point that that rot set in because i probably wasn't in the labor party or certainly wasn't wasn't very close to it but but i think it's a mixture of those two things i mean you've got some people who who i think have got generally really great politics and my own obviously are, are, are on the left who've just got a blind spot conversely there are people with whom i don't have huge amounts in common politically who've got great views on 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 pr so it's that's the other thing it's not even it's not really even cutting left right i mean we've got in our, our core group of labor campaign for electoral reform i've got a group of parliamentarians and you'll go to a meeting and i'll be i don't know ben bradshaw and nadia whitton who right. come from very different traditions within the party right. and who are absolutely united around this issue um but you know in the end it's a rotten game but we can win at it i think that's sorry I missed that. what was that laura it's a rotten game but we can win at it yeah yeah that, i think that's, that's part of the subconscious thinking people don't want to fess up to that really but right that's part it's, of it it's a crooked game and if we can win it yeah um you don't think that um, the Labour can actually win a majority in 2024 um, without embracing PR. I mean, they have to win 124 seats to even get an, uh, you know, a, a majority of one. Then there's boundary changes coming. To be upfront, do you think, I mean, some people say that's just completely defeatist. To say that Labour can't win in 2024, this creates defeatism. What do you think? I think it's a very big mountain to climb. Um, I mean, never say never. Who knows how, um, you know, who, who knows what will happen with COVID and the economy? Um, you know, who, know, who knows where we'll end up with the post, you know, the repercussions of the post-Brexit trade deal? Who knows whether Boris Johnson will be, you know, found in bed with a 15 year old. I mean, although the trouble is then the Tory party will just will just swap him out for another one. So, right. uh, but yeah, 
yeah, objectively speaking, it, it it's a lot to ask. It would require a swing only marginally less than than in 1997 in, in really quite different Good circumstances. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think it's very, I think it's very difficult. Uh, I think it's very difficult to right. see. And I think it would be difficult to see whoever the leader was. Um, so this isn't a sort of Starmer or not observation. But yeah, objectively speaking, that's a very big swing. Right. Now, the Labour Party is not a homogenous group. We think we all sort of know that. Um, what would you say are sort of the sections of the Labour Party that are more open to PR than others? Well, actually, looking at... Um, I don't mean that necessarily left, right. I, I yeah. just whether there's a particular demographic Young people um... look i think it's um the, the numbers i mean yougov did a poll in december last year um this is the point at which i rely on sam if, if everyone sees something in the chat written by samuel kind it's a correction okay and he will be right and i'll be wrong but i think the poll said that 76 percent of labor party members supported pr that's that's pretty overwhelming. Um, that was in 2019. That was just before the election in 2019. Right. Um, we at the moment are working through constituency Labour parties and 157 at the last count had passed motions pro PR. Right. Um, we're doing the tally again this week so we'll have some new numbers out in a couple right. of days and we expect that to take another little leap up. Those motions are coming from across the country um, north, south, east, west. We've had a sort of flurry of activity in Yorkshire and Humberside recently. We've had some motions in the northwest. We started off with a with a good solid chunk of support in <clears throat> in the southwest. And and Mary Southcott, who's on this call as well, I see, you know, has been <laughs> beavering away uh, for many years. And they've got a good solid campaign. But there is no, you know, there's no there's no group that isn't really. Um, supportive we we probably have in terms of left right at, at the two outer edges of the party what what you might call some of the orthodox left that we touched upon a bit before and um some of the sort of class of 1997 perhaps to put it that way um but otherwise um young old male female north south east west they're, 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 they don't there there's no no go area for PR in the Labour Party. And interestingly enough, the latest statistics, I think from YouGov, show that that's increasing the case with the country as a whole. Yeah. So I think 44% of the population in October 20, uh, YouGov is doing this tracker poll and every six months it will update it. Right. And I think they found that 44% of people were pro-PR and, um, and that number's been going steadily up and, and they're finding similarly. It's, it's a UK-wide phenomenon. Right. Now, you know, and there's another group in the Labour Party, in this non-homogenous non party, which we'll sort of call the Corbyn left, or sort of, you know, that group of people who were very active in 2017, 2019, and they've been taking some real hits. I mean, 2017 went... Um, they didn't win, but it sort of came close. Then 2019 was pretty much a wipeout. Then they see Keir Stammer in, in charge. They, there's a lot of dissent, you know, um, against him. How do these people get won over? I mean, we had a little bit of a disagreement there. I, I, this idea that Labour almost won in 2017, I, I really don't think that's because the, the message from that can become, well, then why do we need PR? If we almost won in 2017, uh, like how, how do these people, the Corbynista, just call them that, how do they get won over to a campaign for PR? Well, the first thing is, I mean, I agree with you, by the way. I mean, I sort of report that people think we almost won in 2017, but what we almost won was a pretty fragile coalition with the Liberal Democrats and the SNP and given the dynamics within the Labour Party itself at the time, and I think Jeremy Gilbert probably said this as well, uh, you know, it's not beyond the realms of possibility that even if we had won, that coalition would have fallen apart relatively quickly because of internal Labour Party dissent. Um, so, so, so I, you know, to say that I basically agree with you that 
it would have been a bit of a pyrrhic victory perhaps in 2017. But look, I think lots of the people who joined the Labour Party, you know, and I really was one of them in 2017. Um, 2015. Well, I joined in 2015, went away again, and then really oh, rejoined with great enthusiasm in 2017. So I, I kind of consider myself to be fairly typical of the 2017. Okay, in touch. Um, you know, lots of those people have been on a political journey of understanding about the Labour Party. They right. came to the Labour Party because they had certain very clear political ideas and they hadn't had a chance to express them through the Labour Party before. And, you know, we all hung on and campaigned like Fury in 2017 and did the same again in 2019. But, you know, these are smart, these are smart people. I mean, we, we be, they can understand, there's a, you know, there's a lot made of a sort of resistance, but most of these people are, are very engaged in politics and can understand the way that things are playing out. And 40% of them, by the way, also voted for Keir Starmer in the leadership election. So right. that there's not even a, there's not even a homogenous block on the so-called Corbyn wing of the party. Oh, but I oh. think we will find that more and more of those people are being persuaded. I mean, I mean momentum at the moment is doing a consultation of its membership to see whether people want to take policy issues to conference. And we know already of a number of local momentum groups who've put pro PR motions through their local momentum groups. Right. Our own coalition has submitted one which will be considered. And I'm pretty optimistic that significant numbers of momentum members will back PR. Um, and, and I mean, curiosity perhaps only, but even when Brexit was apparently the great big dividing line, but we surveyed, I had worked for Momentum at the time, we surveyed the views of Momentum members and they were very much aligned with the rest of the Labour Party. Right. So there's right. nothing to suggest that on this, they won't be either. And remember as well, that a large part, particularly of the younger, but not exclusively, but a large part of the younger membership that joined um, for Corbyn came from a div, you know a diverse range of political movements and backgrounds some have been in the green party some have been in the student cuts campaigns yeah, some have yeah. come from the peace movement some were climate activists these are not dyed in the wool yeah, you know yeah. labor party people and and the, and the final point you know i would make is that these are people who are very engaged in in politics and if you look at the 2019 election and, you know, young people in particular are very committed to doing stuff on climate change with good reason, given that we'll all have pegged it and they'll be on a frazzling planet. And if you look at the big casualty of the election in 2019, which I would argue was because of the system, which ends up with this binary fight between Labour and the Tories. So the Tories talked Brexit and Labour sort of tried to talk anything but, but particularly talked about the NHS and public services, the casualty of the 2019 election was climate change. It was not the climate election that it should have been given the state that the world is in. Lots of the momentum people have come through the climate movement. Right. And, and they can draw that conclusion as easily as, as you know, as the rest of us. So, so I'm, op I'm optimistic. Okay, it's good. A couple more questions then. Now this is, this question here just takes a minute to set up. Um, We've heard of male privilege. We've heard mm -hmm. of white privilege. The idea being that certain categories uh, get privileges that they're structurally set into the system. That if you're male, if you're black, etc., or white, I'm sorry, uh, you know, you the, the systematic uh, privilege discrimination, etc. Now, in the UK, first I suppose voting system has created a structure that has privileged two parties, mm. the Tories and Labour. Now it's privileged the Tories more, but uh, it's also, uh, it keeps continuing to privilege the Labour Party. Now, do you think this notion of a, a, a privileged party is a way for people like to make a bit of a breakthrough in their thinking about like, you know, I look back at myself 
I'm 75 uh, or 73. I had a very strong feminist sweetheart in 1970. She said, Alan, you don't know how to cook. You better start to learn. And I learned. And, and you know, you know, this sort of challenging of the privilege, you know, 2005. I mean, you know, it was an outrage that that Blair could carry on with 35 percent of, of the vote and, you know, after the war in Iraq, et cetera, is this notion of a structural privilege of the Labour Party, is that a helpful way to understand things? Well, I certainly think it's accurate. Whether it helps us move parts of the Labour Party is another question, because in the end, this privilege is about power. And, you know, folk don't want to let go of it when they've got it. So, um, I think it's almost about pointing out that this this privilege is a little bit past its sell by date because Labour is so privileged that it can now permanently be the second party in the country. Right. That doesn't sound to me like such a good offer. No, no, it doesn't. It's much better to, in fact, share some of its privilege by joining <laughs> in right. a coalition and have a chance of forming a government. But you're but you're completely right, and this is an interesting thing then about the dynamics of this campaign. Because, you know, and it's enormously frustrating for people who are not in the Labour Party to sort of be told, and I'm probably about to say it myself, hey, if you're not in the Labour Party, you know, tread easily with some of your, of your Labour friends, because in the end, they're the ones that are going to vote at conference. And, you know, the tactics of this campaign are kind of counterintuitive for PR people, because PR people are generally instinctively kind of quite pluralist relaxed about being in a room with people from different parties um, and and yet in the end we're going to win this campaign because we win a battle in the Labour Party which is going to be won primarily by people who are in the Labour Party which That's is going right. to require a sort of enormous patience and magnanimity from the non-Labour Party people who need Labour to change. Now actually there's a long list of things I think that non-Labour Party people can still do to help this campaign succeed. Um, but we're a little bit stuck in that vicious cycle that until some of the people in the Labour Party have persuaded their fellow Labour Party people to let go of some privilege, those who are outside the Labour Party probably have to focus some of their efforts elsewhere. By the way, whoever wrote Clive Lewis for leader, <laughs> you know, obviously I think he would have been a great leader. Um, so, and, and, and Clive Lewis is one of the few who, of course, could embrace this change. And that's, in what, my view, one of the reasons why he didn't make it onto the ballot paper. Right. Because right. he was basically saying, right. we have to be prepared to give away some of this privilege. Right. Now, um, so yes, I, I think your analysis is right. The campaign response to it is probably still that we need to have horses for courses. So if you are a Labour Party member, lobby the constituency Labour Party in your area. If you're not a Labour Party member, it's probably not a good idea to lobby your constituency Labour Party in your area. Because it, it will it will be counter it will be counterproductive. I promise I wouldn't get into a big debate about it. I, I just really disagree. No, no, but I think it's a debate we need to have because the question is how does a coalition which is cross party engage in a campaign which is about persuading one party? Yeah. And I suppose my big plea is that we made lots of mistakes in the Brexit campaign. I mean, you probably have a range of different views about, about Brexit, but I thought and think it's a terrible idea. But the, the campaign that tried to persuade the Labour Party to change its position, one of its, one of its challenges was that much of that came, campaign came from outside the Labour Party. And it made it too easy for the Labour Party to ignore it because it wasn't its people. So well, what are the campaigning things that non-Labour Party people can do to help the Labour Party change? And, and part of that is to keep the noise up around the party, to work on the general public. I can assure you, Laura, we are really trying to keep the noise. No, 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 you guys are doing a brilliant job. I mean, the other thing is to, is to, you said before, and I'm not sure I completely agree with you, that it's true that the first thing for this cap, for this particular sort of coalition is to win a motion at Labour Party conference. But we need in parallel with that, and we need that to pick up over the summer. And as we get to conference, 
we need there to be sort of demand from the general public, because one of the things that will persuade the Labour Party leadership to change its mind is not just what does this feel like for my own party membership, it's what does the electorate think about this? So we need that 44% that you have are finding back PR, we need that to become 52, 54, 56, in order to give the party leadership confidence that this has got electoral viability and not just internal Labour Party sort of sellability. Right. And that is definitely something that all of the people here who are not in the Labour Party can do. 